On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA's Psyche asteroid probe finally launches with the help of Falcon Heavy, SpaceX defends their Starlink constellation in the face of a new FAA report, and Spin Launch gets a wealthy new partner. This is The Space Race. On a soggy Friday morning, NASA's Psyche asteroid survey mission finally got underway, lifting off from Pad 39A on a Falcon Heavy rocket. The October 13th launch went off without a hitch after more than a year of delays forcing the $1.2 billion probe to wait for the start of its journey to a metal-rich body in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter over 2.2 billion miles away. Psyche is named after 16 Psyche, the asteroid it will be studying. Discovered in 1852, 16 Psyche is the biggest known metal-rich asteroid in the system, of which we only know 9. This big metal object is 173 miles by 144 miles, roughly potato-shaped, and orbits so far from us that scientists can only make it out as a small pinprick of light, so they aren't even sure of its composition. They know it has high metal content, of course, but are unsure about the other parts of its makeup, which could be rock or sulfur, anything really. And it's this mystery that the Psyche probe was made to unravel. The 6,000 pound probe is going to take six years to reach its destination, using Hall Effect electric thrusters to slowly but steadily accelerate halfway there before decelerating. This system uses power from the probe's two five-panel solar wings to ionize the atoms of its xenon fuel in a very efficient reaction. Once in orbit around the large asteroid, the Psyche probe will use two multispectral cameras, a pair of magnetometers, and both a gamma ray and neutron mass spectrometer to check for the chemical composition up close. It's also equipped with a radio experiment that will attempt to measure the asteroid's gravitational field. That's a lot of equipment, especially for a mission that had been delayed so long. 16 Psyche had been chosen as a mission target for the Discovery program back in 2017, this being the same program that produced the Pathfinder and InSight Mars Lander missions. Originally targeting a 2023 launch, the date was moved to 2022 to match a more efficient trajectory, but then along came COVID and messed everything up, forcing the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to push the launch date back to 2023 again. An independent investigation of JPL and the delays to Psyche found that a lack of staffing was primarily responsible, which, yeah, COVID had been keeping people out of the lab for most of 2020 and 2021, so no surprise there. And then, just when they were preparing for an October 5th launch, the team found an issue with the engines, and the whole thing was forced to delay one more week until Psyche finally got its date with a Falcon Heavy on the 13th. And that sort of effort, price, and scale of mission tips us off that Psyche is a little more important than it looks on the surface. And that's because 16 Psyche represents a unique opportunity to see what the inside of our own planet could look like. Metal-rich bodies like this asteroid are relatively rare at this size. Again, we only know of nine in the whole system so far, and scientists at NASA believe there are two possibilities for how it formed. One, 16 Psyche was the core of a protoplanet, a molten ball of rock that got smashed out of its planet during the formation of our solar system. Or two, it's an unmelted bit of metal that was part of the original material drifting around our star when everything was forming. Either way, we get a good chance to see what the core of our own planet looks like, its composition, gravity, magnetic fields, and maybe even how it formed. And it doesn't hurt that the Psyche probe will be helping NASA test the current strength of our deep space laser communications grid, a system that we are currently building out and will be extremely important for our operations around Mars and beyond in the next couple of decades. Unfortunately, any dreams of mining this asteroid are not realistic. While the amount of metal 16 Psyche contains makes it worth somewhere in the 10 quintillion dollar range, that's only a raw estimation that looks fun in video titles and headlines. Truthfully, we don't have any technology that could safely bring 16 Psyche close enough for mining to be feasible, and the amount of metal it has would flood markets, making it relatively worthless. So we'll just have to keep it in mind if we're ever in need of raw materials for space manufacturing when we have that technology. 
For now, the real value of this asteroid is in what it can tell us about our own planet and planets like Mars. These sort of surveys help with everything from material sciences to asteroid defense, just like the OSIRIS-REx mission, which recently returned a capsule full of regolith from Bennu, a much more common type of asteroid, while the main vehicle went on to study the potentially dangerous asteroid Aphophis. In that case, the samples returned could help us with strategies for dealing with those sort of objects if they are ever projected to hit Earth, but also find out about how more organic materials made it into Earth's composition in the first place. Sometimes it's enough just to be curious about something. After all, there's a lot we still don't understand about our universe. All right, everyone, before we delve deeper into today's topic, I want to share a travel story and the role language played in it. A huge shout out to Babel for not just being part of this journey, but also for supporting this video. On my recent trip to Spain, I realized the importance of knowing the language, even if just the basics. That's where Babel swooped in as my trusty sidekick. Two Spanish phrases became my go-to, and trust me, they enhanced my travel experience. Puedo tener esto por favor, which translates to can I have this please, which was helpful to navigate ordering at restaurants, and cuál es la contraseña de Wi-Fi, data costs a lot while traveling in Europe with Canadian phone plans, so knowing how to say what is the Wi-Fi password was super helpful. But why Babbel? Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. For one, it's crafted by experts in language education, a genuine touch to language learning. The live classes are immersive, giving a classroom-like feel right at home, plus the assurance of a 20-day money-back guarantee made my decision easy. So here's a golden ticket for those itching to dive into a new language. Click the link below to grab 60% off on Babbel. I'm curious, where do you want your language skills to take you next? Share your dream destinations or reasons in the comments below. On October 5th, the Federal Aviation Administration posted a report on the risks associated with the re-entry of low-Earth orbit satellite constellations, and in a rare move, SpaceX has already fired back. Back in 2020, the FAA was ordered by Congress to hire an independent body to report on the potential risks of all these new satellite constellations popping up, of which SpaceX's Starlink was and still is the most prominent. But while the report suggests that by 2035, we should expect debris from deorbiting constellations to injure or kill one person every two years, SpaceX says that the report's authors, a company called the Aerospace Corp, used outdated information and guesswork. First off, reports like these are almost always guesswork based on available statistics, so that part isn't what's wrong with the report. Aerospace Corp was asked to calculate risk based on available data, and they did that, finding that on average, the space industry hasn't quite met the required 90% success rate for disposal of debris after a mission, which primarily includes debris from launching rockets. And to be fair to Aerospace Corp, knowing that SpaceX has permission to grow their Starlink constellation to 12,000 satellites and wants to continue growing to over 40,000 low Earth orbit units, they're right in thinking that math equates to a significant risk from just SpaceX alone, never mind other constellations like Amazon's Project Kuiper. But here is where the SpaceX rebuttal raises some really good points. First off, SpaceX principal engineer David Goldstein, who wrote the company's reply, says that the original analysis makes the assumption that SpaceX has the same after-mission disposal rates as the rest of the industry, when it is in fact one of the industry's leaders in that regard, performing at a 99% disposal success rate post-missions, mostly due to the reusability of company vehicles like the Falcon 9. But second, and most importantly, SpaceX designed their Starlink units to fully demise, as Goldstein puts it, meaning their components and structure are so delicate that nothing survives the heat of the re-entry process, and this has been proven as over 350 Starlink satellites have reportedly deorbited to date, and no news of debris has cropped up. And this is where the report really falls flat. The analysis done by the Aerospace Corp uses a 23-year-old study from NASA about debris survival rates of old Iridium communication satellites, which are so far removed from the way that modern satellites are made that this data couldn't accurately predict danger statistics for any current constellations. Now, this isn't to say that Aerospace Corp is the only one at fault here. Yes, they used bad data, and they never bothered to reach out to companies like SpaceX to get updated models for re-entry, something that SpaceX would likely have complied with 
seeing as how Aerospace Corp was working for the FAA at the time. The real issue is that the FAA accepted the report and published it without double-checking. And look, government agencies tend to be underfunded and understaffed, but this is the FAA's whole job. They published a report that didn't take into account data newer than two decades old that didn't consider constellations from foreign governments like China's upcoming Guang network and didn't consider recent changes to FCC filings, assuming over 54,000 licensed Starlink satellites as opposed to the current number, which is about 7,500 or so. The report itself also seems to have focused on the growth of the SpaceX system, sidelining other constellations like Amazon's Project Kuiper, which I mean, we make jokes about Amazon not being any competition, but we're not a regulatory body. The biggest issue with this flop is that this sort of report is actually needed. SpaceX has a great record, but even they lose track of a fairing or have an uncontrolled re-entry of a rocket, and they're far from the only ones operating right now. Consider what the space race will look like by 2035. Regulations need to be made, but this report is just a waste of resources. The FAA will need to find a more trustworthy, independent body and start over. Earlier this month, space technology startup Spin Launch, makers of the world's first kinetic orbital launch system, announced that they had formed a partnership with Japan's Sumitomo Corporation. The Japanese investment firm has agreed to take on not just its usual investment type role, but they also want to represent Spin Launch and all of its hardware within Japan's borders, with the stated goal being to foster sustainable space technologies. Some of you might remember that Spin Launch has basically developed a high-powered catapult using a giant centrifuge inside of a vacuum-sealed chamber to throw a payload at over 4,700 miles per hour into the upper atmosphere. Once the vehicle reaches an altitude of about 60 kilometers, it activates its engines and finishes the orbiting process. This method removes the need for a traditional first-stage booster, the part of a vehicle that easily takes up the most weight of a rocket. But the spin launch system is not without its own drawbacks. Just the logistics alone are a huge problem, with a 300-foot diameter vacuum chamber being needed for the final full-size model, as well with the speeds involved with the wind-up of the centrifuge arm, any potential malfunction could be catastrophic, but that's nothing new in the rocketry field, of course. And it seems like Sumitomo was impressed with spin launch after its smaller scale tests back in 2021. That scaled down accelerator was 108 feet in diameter and hurled its test projectile up to 9.1 kilometers in altitude. It was an extremely impressive display of engineering. Spin launch has come up with a pretty unique way to get payloads into space and it's great that they've secured a huge investing partner to help them across the finish line. Seeing the full-sized version is going to be incredible. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.